payments space, in my opinion, is the most intriguing and potentially impactful area of the entire fintech revolution. I think it's fair to say that the innovation that's occurring in this space right now is going to change the world forever. As such, I wanted to do an interview to talk about the UK's position as a leading player in the global payment space. And in light of the continuing popularity of alternative digital currencies and and payment methods, I wanted to pose the question, what does the future hold and where is all this going to end up? I spoke to the Chief Risk Officer of Payments for MasterCard, Tim Neal, at their offices in London. And what a pleasant guy. We talked about his love of endurance racing along with the global macro picture and his forecast for the payment space over the next couple of years. Uh, we also covered Bitcoin, global remittance, the advent of the CBDCs, the incredible story of the Kenyan Impesa, and inevitably the long-held rivalry with Visa, uh, and much, much more. MasterCard are a fascinating, world-renowned organization, and Tim is a down-to-earth guy who I could have spoken to for hours. If you like payments, if you like fintech, well, even if you don't, you will inevitably love this one. It is Tim Neal. So, Tim, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we are down in your offices in Cannon Street in London. Thank you for the MasterCard cycling jerseys. They will be they are very well received. Welcome. Uh, and thank you for your time as well. It's a lovely day here in London. Uh, we've been really excited about this, this interview. First of all, I just wanted to ask you, there's lots going on in the world right now. There's a war in Ukraine. There's turbulence in the financial markets. What's on trend at MasterCard right now? What kind of thing are you talking about in your board meetings? The space that I work in is largely looking at real-time payments is yep. the world that, that uh, my team and I uh, play in, which is different from the card rails place. So uh, if you think about um, the difference between the two is, of course, you know, MasterCard, obviously, most people would know it because of the credit card system. But what we also do is real-time payments, or some people call it account-to-account uh, -account payments, ACH, auto-clearing payments. So that is what we know here in Britain as faster payment service and the backed payment service and those sort of things. So the ability to move money between two accounts. Absolutely. So for the listeners who are not familiar with yourself, they'll obviously be familiar with MasterCard, but maybe not yourself. Can you tell us uh, maybe a little bit of a, give us a summary of your career? Yep, sure. So as my accent probably gives away, uh, not from England at all or Britain, uh, but from Australia but I've been here for about 20 odd years now. So, so my background actually, I, by accident, not by design, uh, sort of fell into the sort of finance industry really. I did uh, police studies, so sort of criminology background, criminal justice studies, and came over to the UK 20 odd years ago to um, sort of fill a gap between leaving university and getting a real job and ended up being offered a consultancy role at Goldman Sachs. And, and that sort of kicked off my career and, and I sort of, you know, fell in love with, you know, the high speed intensity of, of high volume trading environments and, and the banking system and London itself, of course, being, you know, this uh, incredibly fast moving um, place that's, you know, was fascinating to work in. And that sort of started the process. And so I went into a security role at uh, Goldman's and then from there, spent a couple of years there uh, at consulting and then moved over to Barclays and spent a couple of years consulting there again in, in a security risk capacity and then sort of moved through a couple of other businesses in a similar sort of uh, functional role, looking at either resilience or risk or security in, in all those fields. And it really was sort of following a technical advancement of all those different banking operations that were running around the world. When I first got into banking, I can remember the what was then um, the FSA, now known as the FCA, the FSA. Yep. Had, was starting to put out requirements for the big banks to have resilience and failover and disaster recovery and data centers, um, you know, set a certain distance away from the core bank and so on. And because I was working in the sort of physical security and resilience side, that was sort of within our wheelhouse to be responsible to help the banks design and build those recovery suites uh, around the location. And so by necessity, I started to become quite technically aware 
And yeah. so I had to understand how the trading systems work in enough detail to be able to understand how to you know, move applications in real time over to recovery sites and then looking at things like data storage provisions. And so over the last couple of decades, I've just sort of really cut my teeth in that, that field. And sure. so led me into the risk role that I work in now. So when a child asks you, I'm sure you've got a, a young relative, and they ask you, Tim, Uncle Tim, what do you do for a living? What's your response? So, well, I've got a 10-year-old who thinks that what I do isn't very cool. Uh, <laughs> he he su- suggested the other day that I might want to change jobs, do something more fun like be a cowboy or, uh, <laughs> or a fire, pirate or a or fireman astronaut. pirate. <laughs> 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 so, but I was explaining it to him recently, and I said that I'm the chief risk officer for the real-time payments business at MasterCard. And that he sort of screwed his face up, and that's what he said, that's not very cool, Dad. Uh, <laughs> what does that mean? But our, our purpose is to help the business identify risks that they already have in place and quantify those. So how big, how wide, uh, what, what will it take to fix them or remove them, or how to manage them if they're to be risk accepted, because some risks simply can't be removed mm. because of the nature of the business. And also to enable them to be able to quantify that risk in terms of a materiality level. So what does it mean in terms of the service outage provisions or against the regulations that are in place? And then also to identify risks that are emerging. So risks that we see that are coming. And and, and that can include anything from the geopolitical noise coming out of the Russia-Ukraine events, which is a number of people will will tell you is one of the principal drivers for the inflation that we're seeing at the moment that's that's running because of supply and and whatever you for, for various um, you know, items that are harder to get. Also being able to articulate things like the, you know, the effect of COVID, the effect that that's had on the markets around the world, um, and certainly affected things like our ability to be able to get certain key equipment and hardware for, for our, our technology requirements. So we spend a lot of time um, looking at those sort of risks. And we do that through a whole range of ways, whether it be uh, researching through you know, peer organizations or various forums um, that run or specific investigative work that we're doing um, with our partners or suppliers and what have you. Mm. And then ultimately what we have to do then is convert all of that risk summary that I just talked about into a quarterly report. And that risk report goes to the risk committee and the risk committee then effectively interrogates that report and determines whether the materiality that's being declared by the business owners is in fact correct. Sure. And that then goes to the board for review. And so there's a a corporate governance process effectively seeks to try to identify and, you know, keep the business honest, but also help the business get to a point of effective management more quickly and transparently. You've worked within banking for a number of years, but when did you first dip your toe into payments as a specialism? Was it Vocalink? Was Vocalink, yeah. So so Vocalink was about four years ago I joined, which at the time had recently been acquired by MasterCard. Right, yeah. So of Vocalink is the UK payments service that, yeah, was, sure. that was founded, I think, 48 years ago now. Yeah. And yeah. it was the origins of Vocalink was effectively it was a, a formation or, a, if you will, almost a co op of all the UK banks wanting to create a system where they could move money intraday mm. between the banks. Sure. Well, that's how, that's how Visa come about, isn't it? Yeah. I think. It yeah. Was, it and was MasterCard. Collaboration yeah, that's MasterCard. right. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, the payment system you got in eight years ago to the payment space, what's changed in the last eight years? What's the most significant change you've seen in the industry in the last eight years? For us, there's the speed at which the rest of the world is catching up. So one thing to say that... Because the UK is, is a market leader in many respects. Isn't it, it is the market leader. With, yeah, between the UK and Scandinavia, they're probably the most mature markets, closely yeah. followed by or competitively followed by, if you will, Singapore and, and maybe Australia and New Zealand. Really, the UK in many ways leads the world in terms of innovation and, and new types of payment rails that exist. Yeah. Certainly things like the faster payment system, the BACS payment system, et cetera, that exists in the UK is very much seen as being the benchmark of good payments. Absolutely. Mm. So we talked about the the development of the payment space up until now, since yep. you've been involved. 
what does the, get in the crystal ball? Or what does the future look like? What are you most excited about in terms of innovation in the payment space right now? I would say for me, something that will be the most dynamic in terms of changes will be real-time payments, but at a cross-border level. So we run the national payment services or national real-time payment services as, as the engine room, in effect. Yeah. But that stops at the UK border. So the, the volume of you know, the foreign transaction market is enormous. So some people will see it as the FX market, and that is you know, basically sending currencies around the world. But there's an opportunity there to be able to enable the connection between two countries' real-time payment systems. Yeah. I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. But the other one that's that's really interesting and that I think will be quite incredibly changing in terms of the, the future state for some of the frontier and emerging markets in the world, and that is the home send remittance market. So a home send remittance is where uh, someone who is a uh, considered to be a foreign worker yeah. from who is working in country A but is from country B sends their earnings home. This is a big issue in Latin America, isn't it? I know El Salvador legalized Bitcoin 100, mainly because of this problem, didn't they? And there's some of the world's largest populations have an, a huge diaspora of foreign-based workers who send home incredible volumes of cash back to their countries. Yeah. And they use that money to pay for you know, domestic needs. So, sure, yeah. You know, it's a massive part of GDP. Kids' school isn't fees it? or you know, prescriptions or rent yeah. or what have you. And it is a huge part of the GDP. And at the moment, the way that they have to send that money home, that their options are pretty limited and they're expensive. Right? Yeah. So the average is, I think, about 11% in fees wow. for that money to be sent home. And so if you're a, a low earner working mm. in a foreign currency, you're sending all of your money back to your home territory. Uh, taking 11% bite out of that is significant. Yeah. So where I think the big transformational change will come is when there is real-time cross-border payments enabled because those populations that are working foreign-based yeah. will be able to send money in real-time and those fees would be radically different, as in incredibly reduced. Mm. Now, that increases the, the payment flow volumes, likely, uh, would be my suggestion, and, and then changes the nature of the way that recipient country can forecast and predict the volumes that are coming into that country. Right, And that has a huge change for, for many of those foreign countries because it, it, it is a significant flow of their GDP. And if you make that, if you reduce the friction, as we describe it as, by yeah. creating the real-time payments concept, you reduce the fees, you then are likely to see greater volumes coming into that country, which is beneficial for, for all those people in that recipient country. So you think yeah. about the way that... You know, you, you go out for dinner with a friend and you decide you're going to split the bill later. And so you, you move money <laughs> between... the eternal problem. Right? <laughs> you move money between two people. And you enter their account details and you flick them the, you know, half the bill. Mm. Um, and you expect that money to arrive within a very short period of time. So that's, that's assumed now and that becomes an expected service that exists in the UK. Many countries overseas, that's impossible. You have to write them a check. Yeah, that's in, that's the good old-fashioned way that we used to know and love. Of you know, five to seven days later, perhaps that money then lands in your friend's account, and you, you know you've got to watch your account because at some point that money's going to get drawn down, and, and you know so on. So, one the the you know the the part that's interesting for me is firstly in a, on a on a sort of an, an international scale, domestic real-time payment services is really really only available in a small number of countries. Yeah. That's the first thing. And so once you start to get more countries enabled onto a real-time payments or an ACH payments vehicle, that then sets up quite interesting conversations for cross-border real-time yeah. payments. And so we're, we're building at the moment a service, we happen to build a service called P27. And P27 is a, a future state of where three of the Scandinavian countries will be able to conduct real-time cross-border payments in multi-currency capability. So Sweden, Denmark, and Finland are participating in, in this. Potentially future state will be Norway as well. Mm. Uh, and they'll be able to move money between those three countries, whether they're at a point of sale in one country or transferring money to a friend over the border. It'll happen at the same speed as you sending money to your mate down the road for sharing dinner last night. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> which is so. This will be the first time it's ever been done. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. That's that's really exciting. Then, so you guys have created a risk and payments framework 
for organizations yeah. to have like a global standard. Tell, tell us about how that came about and what you're doing to yeah. create this global standard. Okay, so we're selling national payment system enablement to nation states all around the world. And we run payment systems and provide payment software into countries like Thailand and the Philippines, Peru, uh, Denmark, like I mentioned, UK, et cetera. So we're really diverse in our markets. And they all have different levels of regulation and, and what have you. And so the concept we put forward was let's write a rule book for payments using yeah. the experience of the mature markets that have real-time payments, such as the UK, and taking all the parts that we know to be international best practice standards and methodologies and collect that into a single library. Mm, so we did that. Sure. And so we've got this library of artifacts of over, I think, 500 artifacts now. And so we now offer a service to our customers around the world where we'll go and sit down with them and from that library, down select key uh, rules and benchmarks and standards that then can become uh, that country's rule book for payments. And that then gives them a foundation to be able to create a platform of good governance. Yeah. Because the ultimate goal is to protect the consumer, right? So the citizen who's using the payment system, in the same way you expect here today your faster payment service to work instantaneously, so too should every other country that then wants to stand up that real-time payment service. And so the question sits, how do you manage that? And so what is the mechanism to ensure that it's run appropriately? And how fast should the transaction move? And what, it's, what is, is its resilience and its failover, et cetera? All these sort of questions we then collate into that rule book for payments. Mm. We've gone ahead and done that. And next week I'm in Africa speaking to the African Central Banks at a conference in Tanzania where we're presenting exactly that piece of work. And the, the idea behind it is to work with those countries to give them a set of standards that sets them up to be able to be measurable against peer countries' standards. Yeah. And then you start getting into that quite exciting conversation to say, well, if one particular country is running a set of standards that are recognized by all the financial institutions that participate in that payment scheme domestically, and their neighbor has the same or similar types of benchmarks and standards, then it's quite easy to conceptualize a cross-border rule book that then links those two countries together and allowing their central banks or their regulators to create a common criteria approach to real-time payments. And so yeah. when you look at that from a financial inclusion point of view, you start to be able to bring folks who are unbanked is the phrase, or yeah, underbanked. Which is still a large part of which the is global population. Which is an enormous population, part of the population. It? Huge, huge part of the population. Mm. You start to offer those folks who have, you know, who are often very connected on a cellular phone network system, Yeah, but it may be completely unbanked, domestically speaking. So they sit in this grey economy. And so what, what that does is that, that, that makes it difficult for the government to be able to predict things like true treasury values of transactions and what have you. If you enable that smartphone to be able to sit in a real-time payments rail without the need necessarily to have a bank account, you then start to be able to offer the ability for that particular part of the community to start receiving larger volumes of inflow or more frequent inflows of cash because you've got a rule book that gives everyone a clear and transparent set of standards with which the service has to be run against. We talked a little bit up there about the unbanked. There's an enormous amount of people in the world who are unbanked, but there's a smaller number of people who don't have mobile phones. You know what I mean? So digital technology is in the hands of, of way more people than, the, than, than those who have bank accounts. And therefore, I, this, my favorite case study of this is it was in Kenya, which I think we did touch upon before, yeah. which is people using mobile phone credit instead yep. of the local currency. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because it was just more convenient. Yeah. It's called the M-Pesa, I think, isn't it? M-Pesa was one of the first, if you will, real-time payment services in the world. Yeah. So the Kenyans were leading the way. Yeah. And and they came up, they've now matured that a lot, uh, uh, much, much further so along. So just to clarify for the listeners, though, people were, ex were using mobile phone credit as a medium of exchange yeah. for goods and services, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, almost like a... Astonishing. A, it was like a, a, a world-leading digital asset. And intended, though. It was yeah. crazy. So. That's right. And it's amazing how humans will find a way, right, through these sort of, <laughs> you know, rather than, yeah, rather than good old, card, you know, hard cash. Yeah. They found it more convenient to transfer digital credits yeah. to and each other. And this was going on 10 years ago, wasn't it, yeah. in, in Kenya, yeah. maybe even longer. Yeah. It's not like the last couple of years, it's Correct. a while back. And they were doing this similar in Malaysia 
uh, and in other parts of the world. Really? And so, yeah, and so it, 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 you can see where this becomes hugely viable in the... Yeah. If you're standing there, you know, and you're wanting to buy and sell goods and services and yep. you have got the money on one device and you've got a recipient on an equivalent device on the same network and you want to be able to trust that you can send, you know, your transaction of 100, whatever it is, to sure. that particular person, you want to have that trusted network because then everyone will use oh, of it. of course. But yeah. then it's got to be resilient. It's mm -hmm. got to be always up. Yes. So then you get this expectation because it becomes ubiquitous in its use. Mm -hmm. So there, therefore, you need to have a set of rules to make sure that all the participants are given fair and equal chance to run and participate in that mm -hmm. service. And so that's what we, we propose to write is exactly that, a rule book for payments. So when you were just explaining that, a lot of what you said was if people had just tuned in, you could have been talking about the Bitcoin network there because it is set up with a lot of those things in mind. So price volatility today aside, because we yeah. know there's been a lot of turmoil in the markets recently across all sectors, to be fair, but Bitcoin adoption is growing and increasingly as a as a payments rail as well. We talked about El Salvador briefly. So what, what does, you know, MasterCard, I know you became a bit more crypto friendly recently, allowing people to purchase uh, digital assets on, on MasterCard credit cards. Yep. And that, you know, I'm sure that's something that you will embrace in the future and, and do more of. But what is your sort of personal view on the Bitcoin network? Do you, do you see it as a threat in terms of the payment rails to MasterCard or is it something you're going to embrace and work alongside? What, what are you thinking right now in terms of the, the um, increasing adoption of decentralized digital assets? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm probably like a few people sort of waiting to see what's going to happen a little bit. And, and you can read, as I often do, different market commentators come through with very strong opinions either, either way. It's quite... Yeah, it's polarizing, isn't it? In that that people either they either sort of love or hate uh, tokens or digital assets, depending on their particular view. But look, I, I think even with the market volatility that we're seeing today, some people are saying, you know, I've, I've seen you know recent commentary saying Bitcoin is dead, and I saw I read an interesting article yesterday that said it's died forty five times in the last you know two years or whatever the statement was, and though the, the point being, of course, is that it, it sort of keeps being reborn yeah, sure. and, and, and I would suggest it's probably a similar or it's akin to the impasse experience of many years ago. The humans needed to find a method of transaction that was more appropriate for the lifestyle that they are living. So it does, it, it does raise the question of, of it, you know, whether it be Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or some other form of token, um, is it inevitable that something will, will come out of the state of where we are? Yes, something will come out of it. Yeah, uh, and I think it will look different from cash because cash has limitations in terms of you know the speed, the, the physical nature of it means it's got limitations, and because we are now such a connected society on a digital platform, it seems inevitable to me that a digital asset that that is it comes in the form of a token mm -hmm. has to come out in some way, form or function. Now, the next question of that is how do you then? Uh, value that token. So what yeah. does it peg against? And you hear lots of discussion around sure. pegging against, uh, you know, fiat currencies. So is it, you know, and you've seen even, you know, issues with some of those services that peg themselves against the US dollar. Yeah, recently. stable coins. Yeah, yeah right. So I, I think it's inevitable that we will eventually see some token come through that will be sort of the survivor or a series of survivors, sure, yeah. plural, that will, I suspect the market will naturally or almost through evolution find which ones are the most suitable based on consumer demand and yes. need and then it, that will probably then set itself against a methodology of exchange that's considered both fair and transparent yeah sure you know yeah i think it's like a bit like the dot com boom in the in the late 90s and early 2000s i think there was a lot of really bad companies then but there was amazon in amongst that and there was other you know yeah. really good companies and uh, e-commerce wasn't going to die it was inevitably coming but which ones are going to be the global standard, you know what I mean? Which ones well, are going to be adopted? I, I, I spent uh, a bit of time working at the London Stock Exchange. And, oh, of course. And, yeah. and that found its life by, if you walk around a couple of the pubs and, and other places around central London, you'll see some historical statements that talks about, you know, various wine bars and coffee houses being the points of exchange preceding the London Stock Exchange. And its birth <laughs> was to be able to 
create an ex, you know a, a trading environment for all those traders to meet and you know yeah basically sell their trades if you will or their their products i think the similar thing will happen so we've got all these if you will digital pubs and coffee houses yeah sure the moment that are out there i think it's inevitable that that you'll have a, a thinning of the the herd yeah and i think we'll eventually get down to a common approach to digital token and a common approach to marketplace exchange Sure. No, yeah. agreed. Um, what about CBDCs? Have you guys, do you guys get consulted? By, I know there's plans in central banks. Are they talking about this? It looks like it's coming at some point. Mm. Do they talk to companies like MasterCard? They and- do, yeah, all the time. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, it, we offer lots of different services, but you know, one of the things that we do do, of course, is, is we're a, a, a rail of payment in different forms. And so we you know, we know how to move messages around the network sure. that carry financial transaction information. So yes, we do talk to them frequently. Um, many of the central banks, and I think, I think that's indicative of where do I think things are going to go. Is if you're seeing so many of the central banks talking about the need for a central bank digital currency, then it suggests that obviously there is enough demand. Yeah. Uh, and if they're working on it, then I would suggest they're probably you know some of those those advisors who will help shape which market it sits on, how it pegs itself, et cetera, that yeah. related to what we are talking about before. I, I don't know who the clear leader is yet. I haven't heard of who is sort of coming out with, you know, the, the most obvious. There's a couple of countries that have already launched, of course. I think we are talking about El Salvador before uh, launching their own. In terms of using Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, the CBDCs that I'm hearing about, though, obviously are just like digital pounds, digital dollars, that type of thing, completely central bank controlled. And obviously you've got El Salvador who've embraced an open source, decentralized yeah. cryptocurrency type situation. Yeah. I can't see big companies embracing Bitcoin as a, as a as legal tender because uh, they lose complete control then, don't they? But I mean, yeah. it, you, you're kind of going back to the gold standard. Do you think that's... Because it's a, obviously it's a hard currency with, you know, it's, it's finite. It's never yeah. going to be any more than 21 yeah. million. So what do you think? It, it, it's interesting. I don't know yet is, is my short answer. And it's um, there. there is so much complexity as to the type, nature and capability that's in place. And you've got to also throw into that conversation, you know, the DLTs, right? So the dis- distributed ledger technologies. Yeah as well because of course you know that's that's the mechanism to move these particular tokens around potentially sure um, which adds a whole range of different you know risk reduction and stability and uh, transparency to this conversation so i think inevitably what will happen is the market is big enough and influential enough that it will sort of find its own path sure uh, and and i think really because of the nature of the way people are educated now on their digital enablement Right. I, I think the, the central banks will listen to, you know, my hope is they'll listen to the population, the consumers, the citizens uh, who want these services. And I think I think fairly soon we're going to see a few winners start to come out in terms of the type, the nature and the, the, the market that they sit on. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think you're right. So I wanted to ask you about the pandemic situation, Tim. We've just come out of an unprecedented period and much has changed in the last uh, three years, I think it's fair to say. What has MasterCard taken from the pandemic situation that you're, you guys are going to potentially take forward? Well, like, like a lot of, um, sort of office-based working, uh, that's now radically shifted for us. You know, of course, we went all, we're working from home um, through all that period. And I think where we've settled now is into the, the hybrid working from home office model. So most of our f- people are in two to three days a week is kind of the typical. But what it's also done, I think, is opened up opportunities for people to work in lots of places that they haven't been able to before, both internationally and, and regionally. And, you know, I know people internally that have taken the opportunity of COVID to move to places where they think, you know, they find a bit of lifestyle. And I certainly don't miss coming into the office five days a week. No. You know, so... That, that change, of course, in, in sort of, I suppose, office culture as a result. One thing we did notice on the some of the challenges around that is, is I, I certainly find, I think some of the relationships change because you don't see people face-to-face as frequently. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that changes for the negative 
and also you you miss out on some of the friendships that used to be there. Sure. You know, so you've always got a couple of work buddies that aren't there as well. So it, it, it's there's positives and, and negatives, but um, overall, I think I think hybrids here to stay. If I'm honest. Yeah, sure. I think there's um, an element of like when you remove serendipity, you know, like random conversations in mm. the office. I think I've read a few blogs and things recently saying that there will be a longer term impact of that in terms of creativity. You yep. know what I mean? Because serendipity and situations, unarising situations which cause you to react in the moment um, when you're working amongst your peers in a face-to-face -face environment tend to sometimes yield things like positive change, you know, do. and yeah. new products and things. Do you think innovation will suffer? I think it will. I sit on the management committee for, for one of the businesses in, in the UK and we discussed at quite a bit of length the teams that were feeling the most sort of fractured from the, the COVID effect. And it's often the, the teams that are in the creative side or in engineering build teams where they're, you know, previously they've been a group of them in a room conceptualizing a product build on a whiteboard is near impossible to do that in a remote sense because you can't interact in it in that sort of creative way uh, and also it, it means that you can't answer you know overly complex situations as fast sure so you end up sort of breaking down what is a faster moving collaborative conversation into five 30 minute meetings over zoom yeah it becomes it becomes a very different experience and j just so the listeners are aware we're sitting in tim's office and there's probably the biggest whiteboard i've ever seen in my life <laughs> in front of us uh, clearly a fan of whiteboards and i'm actually you know sold on it it's uh, this is a great way uh, to communicate ideas for sure but uh, and probably more acronyms than you've ever seen <laughs> yeah indeed there are so Let's talk about more broader technology-based endeavors then. Well, what, what are you sort of, outside of payments, outside of even fintech, what, what sort of tech are you most excited about at the moment in terms of positive societal change? I find, and I, and I participate a lot in trading on, you know, the new easily accessible apps that are out there. I'm not a, I'm not a significant trader in that sense, but um, I like the accessibility to to fintech environments. That's that's what I think is. So do me, you mean like the democratization of yeah, of information and is, the ability yeah. for anyone to invest in yes. things which were only available to certain people? Yeah, correct. Previously, it was a fairly exclusive club to be a yeah, member of. Yeah. You either had to be, you know, you either operated in a, a formal institutional trading environment, or you had to go through a large professional service offering or what have you. Now it is exactly that. It it, it has been brought down to you know the accessibility level is is absolutely grassroots mm. the the mum and dad retail investors are very much active now in the markets and i think that's that's that was intensified through the covid period where people had time at home to be able to perform those sort of you know trades that previously they've never been able to do and also the suggestion was that they had more disposable cash because they weren't traveling into the you know their office every day and you know spending money on spending less money on day-to-day -day things. And so um, I think it's probably true that quite a number of people started to trade that have never traded before. Oh, absolutely. I think it's loads of people who've got into it in the yeah. last couple of years, isn't there? And add to that then, of course, the digital uh, asset piece and the, the various digital currencies that are available uh, also then heightened that. And of course, you know, the market was flying, wasn't it, for, yeah. for quite a while. So that gave rise to a whole lot of, um, you know, new activity and new people on the markets, which I think has had an effect. Um, it'd be interesting uh, it, it, in years to come to see, you know, sociologists analyze where we are now in terms of coming down um, and how that may or may not have influenced it. But either way, I, I, I find it uh, a fascinating change in sort of market interaction in the yeah. fintech space and fintechs collectively speaking. So I don't know if, if you use it, but certainly I use things like, you know, uh, budget apps that help me understand, you know, yeah. where I'm spending my money. And um, you've got lots of options around, you know, um, savings capability and access to ICEs and all these sort of things that, that, that previously, you know, you, you had to go and sit down with someone in a branch of a bank somewhere or an investment professional, et cetera. So that democratization, as you say, uh, I think is, is offering a whole lot of accessibility. And if it's working well in a mature market like this, to, you know, pick it back to the conversation we were having earlier, 
some of those frontier and emerging markets, they have the same level of connectivity in terms of mobile devices and, and yeah. you know digital infrastructure. So the I, I think what that then does is carries itself across into those markets as well. And I think it pushes sure. the whole financial inclusion piece, Yeah, uh, which is the part that I find quite interesting. So it's something I follow quite closely. Can you imagine the amount of talent that is out there that did not fulfill their potential because they didn't have access to certain things. Yeah. I think we're going to see an enormous spike of entrepreneurialism, yeah. digital entrepreneurialism from developing nations over the will. next 10, 15, 20 yeah. years. I agree. And I, and I think necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? And and some of those markets have, I would suggest, a far greater need to, to successfully overcome challenges locally. Sure. And if they have access to funding, they've got access to you know technology vehicles that previously have never been there before, I think you're right. I think we are going to see some pretty interesting capabilities coming out of some of those environments that yeah. have previously been hugely underrepresented. Brilliant. Well, look, I mean, really enjoyed chatting to you, Tim, but I'd like to you know ask you about what, what Tim does outside of work. I know you're into your you're training for an Ironman at the moment. You're into uh, extreme events, if you want to call them that. What kind of stuff do you get up to outside of work? Well, my wife has banned me from rugby, so that's it. <laughs> Career is over. I've done my 30 years. The career is done. <laughs> uh, I now help coach my 10-year-old uh, in his career aspirations for, for rugby. But, um, is that rugby union, yeah? It is, yeah. yeah. Although I wouldn't mind a bit of league as well. Um, oh, yeah. You know, either one of the two I'm, I'm, I'm good with. But, uh, yeah, so it's it's now that no all contact sports are banned. That's uh, no longer allowed. <laughs> So a friend of mine got me into doing some short course triathlons, as they're known, yeah. um, which is sort of sprint and the Olympic distance. I did the London Olympic uh, distance uh, at the London Triathlon last year, which was which was great fun. And so a group of friends friends convinced me to sign up for the the Barcelona Ironman. I'm only doing the half Ironman distance, I've got to say. So I was mentioning before, um, the plan for me is just to finish. I'm just going to get around the course rather sure. than any time. But absolutely, yeah. So. What do you take from the triathlon training and all that kind of thing then? What's your sort of raison d'etre then, your yeah. reason for doing it? It's the, I get out of the work headspace, one, because usually I'm suffering, uh, either running a distance or swimming or cycling. <laughs> uh, and so I'm more worried about myself yeah. uh, and the pain I'm going through. But actually, I, I, I love the experience of that feeling, certainly in anyone who runs or does any sort of endurance sport, will often talk about this, is that feeling you get either once you're in the zone in that activity once you get to a, a, a you know yeah a fit enough stage but also when you come back and and certainly for me you know if i've had a particularly tough day or or there's a very complex issue that that we're trying to deal with one of the things i do find is i'll you know take myself out for a long run usually with the dog and sometimes the, the my son as well will, will chase me on his mountain bike and I come back an hour later and, and whatever was bothering me before seems somehow infinitesimally, you know, <laughs> like yeah. I really couldn't care anymore. You know. It really does help me, you know, sort of psychologically reassess yeah, you know, sure. things that I previously would have considered a stressor yeah. fall away. I think when you are doing something, a physical endeavor, it doesn't yeah. have to be training, it can be anything similar. It brings you into the moment, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it brings you into the now because your brain is in the in the past and the future yeah. so often. Just get in the now, you know. And I think I think that almost that that suffering is cathartic in that. Yeah. You, you realize things could be a lot worse. You know? Oh, absolutely. And, and so it gives you just I think a reference point, and I find it quite grounding. But but for me psychologically, certainly that that for me is my huge de-stressor. So looking back at your career then, you've obviously, you know, you've been very successful up until now and I'm sure you're going to continue that success. But looking back, what advice would you give to yourself as a 21-year-old who's lo looking to embark on a career in the world of business and technology and risk? Do something that you genuinely are passionate about because I think you naturally will find your, your way. If you're passionate about anything, then, you know, you'll give it enough time, effort and, and focus that you'll be pretty good at it would be yeah. my, would be what I would say. And the other thing is don't forget your pension because right? you can never start too early. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's a good advice, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the unsexy bit of advice, but I mean, it's not something that every anyone ever regrets, is it? Compounded interest. Yeah. So if you, yeah, no, but if you can find something you're passionate about, then brilliant. The golden challenge of trying to find something that you love isn't doesn't feel like a job. And, yeah, uh, sure. If you can do that, then then you're winning. 
I think. What kind of piece of content, like a book or a film or documentary or an, I don't know, an audio book or podcast? Is there anything that's inspired you? So one of the things I do listen to is podcasts when I run. And yeah. I tend to sort of voraciously consume some of the uh, economist podcasts that come out with a uh, big international yeah. perspective on what's happening sure. in the world. Uh, and also uh, I listen to there's a, a, a really fascinating New York Times podcast. There's a, there's a few different podcasts that are produced uh, by a couple of different folks out there and and there's too many to name really, but I have an interest about uh, sort of health and well-being in terms of things like, yeah. you know, diets and exercise and those things, more so to work out what I'm doing wrong to myself, <laughs> to get myself across that half Ironman that's coming up. But I do find that fascinating insofar as the link between health and lifestyle and ability to perform. And for me, I sort of link all that together when I can. And, and it's... Yeah. Being a risk officer, one of the things we're constantly trying to scan always is that horizon of of issues that, you know, are out there. And so I try to sort of, I suppose, blend my learning in a in an easy way, if that makes sense, sort of a, almost a passive intake. Uh, so I go for that run for an hour and I might listen to a podcast for 30 minutes of it and come away with, you know, a better understanding of geopolitics of the world or, you know, changing economic picture or, you know, analysis of why, you know, sleep patterns affect your ability to work or concentrate or what have you. Yeah. Um, for me, it's it's more about, I suppose, developing my knowledge as a person about what's happening around me is, is sure what I tend to do. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, look, Tim, I'm so grateful for you to come in on and thanks for hosting us today. You're very welcome. As you quite possibly have heard me mentioning in the past, we record the mass majority of our episodes at an amazing studio facility here in Cardiff at Tramshed Tech. Tramshed Tech is a collaborative community of entrepreneurs and scaling businesses geared towards supporting growth in tech, digital and creative industries across an ever-increasing collection of locations and partner locations, UK-wide and internationally. It really is the perfect place for your business to start up, scale up, accelerate or innovate. Head over to tramshedtech.co.uk or just search Tramshed Tech on your favourite social media platform.